Thank you, Sonia. That was a great uh, um, follow-up to Raju's talk. And now we're going to bring back Raju for more discussion of lower GI abstract. I'm glad that I gave my talk uh, before uh, Sonia gave the talk because I couldn't have added anything after her beautiful talk. All right, so uh, what I would like to do is uh, uh, talk about uh, things that are not uh, technically involved in colonoscopy in terms of uh, answering these uh, questions, right? Uh, first is, uh, how often should we be uh, screening patients uh, for colon cancer screening? You know, right now, interval is 10 years. Can we do a little bit better uh, in terms of extending the interval? And uh, this, uh, this study came from uh, uh, the Boston group. And what they have done is they looked at the risk factors for colorectal cancer that we, are, we know about. And uh, they looked at uh, uh, two large uh, uh, population-based uh, cohorts and uh, assigned a scoring for these risk factors from zero to 12. And uh, what they've done is uh, try to figure out uh, the uh, risk for colorectal cancer in patients who have a negative colonoscopy versus those who had a positive colonoscopy for a polyp. So, uh, as you can see, the blue so the blue uh, line indicates negative uh, colonoscopy screening in terms of the risk for colorectal cancer uh, compared to the positive. But I would like to show you a little more detail in terms of the risk factors. So, somebody with a negative colonoscopy with a score of 0 to 5 is uh, running here, and a score of 6 to 7 is here, and score of 8 to 12 is here. And then these are patients with no negative, or in other words, positive for uh, adenomas or whatever, and then the risk scoring. As you can see here, uh, 0.09% uh, risk, cumulative risk of colorectal cancer at uh, 10 years is the mark here. And when you have somebody with a negative colonoscopy with a low score, uh, that extends up to almost 25 years. So that is very impressive figure to keep in mind. And in those with a score of six to seven, the cumulative risk for colorectal cancer after negative colonoscopy is about 16 years. So this is important to keep in mind because right now there, there are a lot of patients that need to be screened and those who have negative screening, instead of bringing it 10 years, can we extend the interval based on their risk score? Those with low risk, can we push it to beyond 10 years? I think I believe uh, a guideline is going to come uh, in the near future about that. You know, what do I do after a negative colonoscopy uh, in home? I've uh, done a good exam, taken enough time, uh, Boston Bowel Prep Scare of, uh, of nine. I, this is what I do in my practice. I tell them that five years down the road, reevaluate your risk if the family history changes. And I started doing that because one of my patients came back with a family member diagnosed with colon cancer uh, below the age of 60. So that is something to keep in mind because uh, and, uh, that patient's risk will change uh, based on the family history. The next one is uh, uh, when do we stop uh, uh, screening patients when they reach their 70s and 80s? So that is an important question that we all have to ask ourselves. And uh, this is a beautiful study that came uh, from a large group of people, uh, especially a lot of California input here. Uh, so what they have done is they did a micro simulation uh, a model and they looked at uh, in incremental cost effective ratio in terms of the dollars uh, spent for quality of life gained 
and uh, they looked at individuals about the age of 76 to 90, looking at their demographics, age, sex, uh, comorbidities, etc. And they looked at colonoscopy and fit, but I would like to just focus on colonoscopy for the sake of discussion here. So here is a busy slide uh, with uh, uh, looking at optimal age when you can stop uh, colonoscopy. Uh, let me just make this slide a little bit smaller and just focus on colonoscopy. What they have shown is, uh, Uh, what they have shown is, uh, so this is uh, the total group uh, uh, in terms of those who have not had any colonoscopy, those who had colonoscopy 20 years prior and 10 years prior. Uh, women versus men and then depending upon the comorbid status from non to severe and also looking at 10 years prior. So this uh, graph tells us that in men uh, who have severe comorbidities and have had a colonoscopy in the last uh, 10 years, you can actually stop screening them at an earlier age after 70 or 75 compared to women because women actually live longer and have less comorbidities and you can actually probably screen them even in their 80s. That's, that's what I've uh, learned from this uh, uh, abstract. So to just uh, keep it simple, if you have a, a male with severe comorbidities and had a colonoscopy 10 years prior, uh, below 75, you could actually talk to them and say, you're not going to gain much benefit. You can hold off for the colonoscopies. On the other hand, if you have a woman who has no comorbidities and uh, uh, maybe one prior fit test, you can even screen them in their 80s. So this is something important because I'm taking care of a lot of older patients and how to address that. This uh, abstract has been very helpful. So the summary is take into consideration their age, their sex and comorbidities and what do I do in my practice when I'm see seeing somebody in their 80s and they're saying, hey, I want to get screened. Uh, I actually send them to the geriatrician for a formal geriatric assessment uh, and uh, they do have ways to actually uh, address that question uh, especially in patients where you feel uncomfortable in scoping them because you're worried about possible uh, risks. The next one is uh, Lynch syndrome. You know, Lynch syndrome patients need screen, uh, exams every one to two years. And uh, can we actually identify a group that uh, is at less risk for colorectal cancer and increase that interval? So what they have done is as part of this, the group actually looked at uh, employing the FIT test and uh, reducing the uh, hemoglobin concentration at which uh, the FIT is set for to be positive or negative. So, so the FIT threshold, they wanted to see if you can uh, decrease it below 20 micrograms per gram for picking up patients uh, for screening. And uh, they looked at a, a prospective group uh, they did the fit test and before the colonoscopy and looked at can we come up with a fit test and say if it is negative we can increase that interval. So as you can see here uh, the fit test uh, threshold was set at uh, 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 set at uh, uh, 20, uh, 4.08 and 2.55 and uh, if a fit test is negative uh, below 4.08, uh, you have a pretty high uh, rate of confidence to say that that patient, you could actually maybe increase the interval instead of bringing them at every one or two years. That is something important to uh, keep in mind as we are taking care of these patients. You know, because it's not easy for somebody with a Lynch syndrome to come back every year or every two years for uh, screening exams. So the recommendation here is uh, the fit test is less than 4.08. Uh, 
maybe safely postpone colonoscopy in majority of the patients, but I think it's good to present this data and uh, take it from there. The next thing is, uh, you know, we t uh, once in a while we fail uh, reaching the cecum and uh, what to do with them, you know, either to send them for CT colography or should we send them for another colonoscopy. So this is a systematic review uh, that looked at uh, uh, failed colonoscopies and uh, what was done and what were the risk factors. We know uh, a lot about the risk factors and uh, the techniques that people use and uh, what the data showed was uh, patients with different surgeries in the abdomen or a long tortuous colon or severe diverticulosis with uh, angulated and fixed colon, uh, you can fail. In those cases, if you send them to somebody who has a lot of experience doing these cases, uh, they were able to uh, do very well in majority of the patients. And it's also interesting that in all these patients, a third of them had an adenoma and uh, about 2% had a cancer. So instead of sending them for CT colography, probably best is to send them to uh, a center where they can actually do the colonoscopy. So uh, in terms of what do I do, uh, I think uh, important to keep in mind, these are going to be difficult procedures. Probably you have to plan your procedure so that you spend the time. So typically do it at the end of the day so that you can spend the time. And when I'm doing these cases, I'm picking the instrument depending upon the reason for the failure. Long loopy colon, use an adult scope, and now you have several over the scope devices. And uh, uh, I don't have any financial interest, but I've been using a lot more of the uh, pathfinder with a stiffener that has been helpful. Uh, and if it is uh, angulated fixed colon, now every company has uh, three scopes, adult scope, pediatric scope, and a ultra slim colonoscope. I try to go with the ultra slim colonoscope. I also do two things which are important. That is, I shut off the CO2 completely and I use just the water with the water jet to be able to reach the cecum. So now the question comes is uh, in terms of the suboptimal prep, uh, are there risk factors and how do you plan to take care of the suboptimal prep? So this is a study about risk factors for inadequate bowel prep. And uh, it's, uh, you know, in this age, we should have almost less than 5% uh, inadequate prep. But we also know there are several factors uh, that are responsible. And what they've shown is they've identified these as the risk factors. And I think it's, uh, if we as endoscopists are not seeing the patients and these patients are being seen by our mid-level providers, it's good to give them some guidance about how to prepare a patient based on these risk factors, including medications and uh, looking at the prior report and figuring it out. So I think uh, one thing is uh, we always try to do these procedures. Everybody wants the procedure in the morning. If somebody fails the procedure because of suboptimal prep, in my practice, I try to bring them in the afternoon so that they can sleep the night before instead of getting up at 1 a.m. to do the preparation. And uh, they can actually do the prep in the morning, which is much more easier. Uh, uh, that will uh, be helpful. Uh, there's a lot of talk about GLP use uh, in terms of risk of aspiration. Uh, the American uh, Society for Anesthesia recommends that, you know, GLP-1 injectable start one week before, oral one at least start one to two days before. And uh, uh, this group has looked at uh, the risk of uh, various complications because of GLP-1 use. And what they have shown is uh, EGD procedures, colonoscopy procedures in terms of the risk of uh, aspiration and the risk of needing for intubation. They didn't find it significant. Only problem is 
when they're looking at large databases, we don't know whether the patient has stopped or not. You know, they take the databases and try to come up with some data. Uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't have an opportunity to talk to the author to find out exactly whether they knew about uh, somebody stopped the GLP ones prior to the procedure or not. And uh, a lot of buzz about AI and in terms of the AI use and uh, Pratik is uh, at the forefront of this. And uh, what they've shown is in terms of the AI, in terms of the amount of uh, uh, net CO2, right? Uh, it's not all positive, right? You know, uh, the CAD can help AI can help generate, uh, avoid uh, some uh, CO2 generation by avoiding unnecessary resections, but the machine and the development of all those things will also uh, create some CO2. But in the balance, there is a benefit. Uh, for those of you who is interested in learning about AI, this group has written a beautiful paper in gastro that might be of interest to you. So we talked about different things, but one important thing that we should be looking at, two things I feel, is one is a negative colonoscopy, low risk group, can we push it longer? I think a guideline is going to come about that pretty soon. And the second one is, how do you manage somebody who's 75 or into their 80s, taking into, their, taking into consideration their general health and risk uh, factors uh, before putting them through procedures. Thank you.